Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I, I run the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which has been now in virtual mode for almost 18 months. We've been looking at a lot of the issues that we were looking at in the real world, and technology has been a large slice of our business for the last 27 years. We've never actually looked at the cloud. Uh, my skepticism about the cloud was, I think it was Larry Ellison who said there's no such thing as the cloud, it's just someone else's computer. I thought that was a very clever thing to say and I've repeated it at least a thousand times. But cloud computing is clearly a huge business opportunity for all the tech companies and the numbers that are being banded around are awe-inspiring. Uh, it certainly is changing the way that we're viewing uh, internet services, they are now, I guess, um, a utility and cloud computing is the archetypal utility kind of business. We have very, uh, very distinguished panelists. Richard Waters is the FT, the Financial Times' West Coast correspondent, West Coast editor in San Francisco, focused on tech issues in Silicon Valley. He's a former New York bureau chief for the newspaper. He's a tele former telecoms editor. He was in New York with the FT for nine years before he actually became a journalist. He spent two years with Lloyds Bank International in Chile, uh, which I think is fascinating, but uh, like many on the FT, he was educated at Oxford. Uh, Paul Taylor is uh, the founder, the co-founder and CEO of Thought Machine, which he founded way back in 2014 to bring cloud technology to banking and financial services. He was previously with Google, where he led the text-to-speech team, and before that was a co-founder of Phonetic Arts in Cambridge. He has a PhD in linguistics from Edinburgh, uh, but now Thought Machine has offices, I gather, in London, Singapore, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, New York, and it's raised over £110 million in funding. Wow. Uh, batting cleanup is Alina Timofeeva from uh, a senior manager in advanced analytics and cloud at KPMG, formerly, she's been moving amongst the big four, formerly at Accenture and PwC. And I guess um, he, EY is next on the list. Uh, she has an MSc from LSE uh, in risk and finance and also an MSc from uh, uh, Moscow State University, second prize in the Moscow Maths Olympiad. I'm impressed by that. So that's the running order. She's, oh, I'm sorry, I should say that she's on Computer Weekly's uh, list of top women in UK tech. That's the running order. Uh, let me give you Richard Waters. What's actually going on in the cloud sector, Richard? Well, Andrew, thanks very much for that introduction. And uh, I thought I'd start out just by kind of relating, you know, what's uh, what's happening with the cloud as it relates to banks, because as you mentioned, I, I do have a background in banking many years ago. When I, when I first wrote about banking, I, I clearly remember, I think one of the first things I ever wrote was about the, the problem that banks have with these data silos, that, you know, everything was locked up. They couldn't get a complete view of their customers and at the time, of course, they had they had no competition. You know, the market was all theirs. But this was a this was a real problem, both from a risk and a, and the business opportunity point of view. So you know, fast forward all these years, and it is many years. I can tell you, um, it's astounding to me that we are sort of in the same position: a different set of problems, different technology systems. But nonetheless, you know, the banking sector is still characterized by. IT that is geared around product, around channel, it's inflexible, it's expensive. So, you know, fast forward to where we are today, uh, the problems are still the same. And anybody who's, you know, who's covered or works in this sector knows exactly how this works, that, you know, we have IT systems that are geared around product, around channel, they're inflexible, they're expensive. Um, but what's happened, what's happened is competition has arrived. And it is a cloud enabled competition. You know, we all these days talk about fintech. I mean, um, uh, th there's nothing new about technology changing banking, but I think what's happened is we have a new category of, of competitors that are based on the cloud. They have cloud native systems and they can move faster. They can develop greater functionality. Um, 
and and you know they're flexible they're very flexible all the things that banks start now yes they lack what banks have all those customers uh those huge balance sheets those regulated businesses that give them kind of protected access in some ways but nonetheless you know this is now a very different market and so i think for you know for the banks the question is how do you co-opt or how do you benefit from this this new technology without doing the one thing you can't do which is just switch platforms i mean the risk the cost of just ripping it all up and starting again is obviously um you know out of the question so you started off andrew by talking about you know the rise of the cloud these big cloud companies i mean this is this is the public cloud we're talking about these are mm -hmm. amazon google Microsoft, um, you know, they're leading the charge, but a number of others behind them. And they have shared platforms that host data and carry out processing for many customers. And so anybody who puts their data into these platforms, onto these clouds, does so in the full knowledge that they're giving up some control, uh, that they're handing it to a, onto a different infrastructure. Um, and you know, you only have to go back five years and big companies are saying, or even three years, there's no way we're going to put our really important work on those platforms. We're not going to put our mission critical work there because we'll just lose control of it. Well, there's nothing more uh, secure than financial information, obviously, and banks have been slower than some to get here. But I think now we've got to that point where people are finally realizing, look, AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, has um, you know, a very high quality of service. Now, last November, a lot of AWS went down for a period when they, they messed up a server upgrade. Happens to everybody, nobody's immune. But you know, in general, the quality of these networks is, is much higher than the banks are probably achieving internally. Um, and um, you know, there's now enough trust and faith in these very big companies, the biggest of all, to keep data secure uh, and to offer the levels of service that, uh, you know, that, that can enable the banks to run their services on top of. So I think we finally got to that point um, where the banks are thinking, you know, we're not going to go lock, stock and barrel here. We're not going to rip up everything. We're not going to base our strategies around the cloud. But this is a very important outlet for us. It's the way that we kind of leap over this barrier and for particular functions or when we need extra capacity, dial up extra capacity for particular tasks. Um, you know, these are things that, that we can do th through this other avenue, through the cloud. And some of it's happening through partnerships with fintech companies. We can get onto some of that, I'm sure. Um, so, I think you know it's kind of a, a kind of critical moment as to whether these platforms now are in a position are ready for the banks and whether the banks know how to co-opt and use those platforms in a way that benefits them. And you know, I'll just very quickly get on my checklist of of the things they're going to have to solve to do this because it's it's a horrendously difficult thing to manage. I think you know, first of all, they're going to lose control. They're going to lose, or they're going to feel there's a risk of losing control of customer data. They've got to hand it off. To somebody else there's operational risks somebody else is running this um huge is that a reasonable is that a reasonable fear i mean or are the legal restrictions so tight that uh, the cloud operator really can't get access to that data well so so when i talk about control i'm, I'm talking about operational risk you know the danger that a bank will feel that it no longer has control of the infrastructure can guarantee a level of service. I mean, these banks, you know, a lot of the big banks obviously have been running massive data centers and processing vast volumes of transactions, managing huge amounts of data. And the idea, and it's kind of baked into their culture. This is what they do, right? Going back to the mainframe era. So the idea that they're going to just hand that over to somebody else is, uh, you know, that that's uh, mm -hmm. that takes takes some some doing. The privacy and security issues that you raise, um, I think, is the second question. You know, can if they hand off that data, can they be sure? Now, I mean, some of this sounds very abstruse, and I'm no deep technical thinker here. But, for instance, two years ago, we discovered we heard all about a flaw in chip design in very common Intel chips, 
that meant that data that was being processed on processes that are in widely used in cloud platforms, some of the data was being held in cache that's held in the memory on the chip, even when that particular task had finished, which meant that somebody else, a hacker who could get into that system and get into that chip could then get access to that data. The data wasn't being cleared from the cache. I mean, it's kind of deeply technical, mm -hmm. but it was some reverberations through the technology world because it essentially meant that there were no clear partitions, you know, that technical partition inside the very guts of the computers in cloud data was not as great as we thought it was. So, you know, there are there are all kinds of questions here. And I'm 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 sure I think Alina, you know, will know far more than me on this topic. And I look forward to hearing what she has to say on that one. But I mean, just carry on quickly down my checklist and I'll hand off here. But I think you know, a third issue for banks on my list is skills i mean you know do they have the skills the staff you know what they really want to do is get into agile development they want to be able to develop quickly on the fly they want to be iterative they want you know they want they, they want to be modern in their their app development um well you know that's a, that's the big challenge i think and then similarly you know when you when you step into the cloud you're stepping into a different culture a more open culture because to benefit you're really looking at using uh, and opening up APIs. So you're looking at accessing other people's data and processes and giving people access to your data. And it's the more, to, to really benefit, I think you've got to have that more open culture. And again, you know, that's a big one for banks to swallow, like, are they ready for that? And then just finally, I'll, I'll just mention, you know, clearly the, the system complexity, IT complexity is something that banks need to get away from. Well, living in this hybrid world, they're going to be in for quite a while now. They're going to keep a lot of stuff on their own system, but they're also going to want to benefit from the public cloud. And managing both of those, uh, often for common tasks, is going to be very, very complex. So I'll, I'll cut off there, but I think... Um, you know, well, let me, let me ask you one, one thing. You've mentioned repeatedly the, the public cloud, but there are private clouds and some of these banks are so enormous and the amounts of data that they have, the, the their geographic reach and everything. I mean, are, are the banks themselves also looking at private clouds as an intermediate step before they actually go to the public cloud? They are, I mean, the very biggest obviously, you know, um, essentially, you know, they're taking IT infrastructure and they're, you know, they're, uh, virtualizing it and doing all the things that you would in a public cloud but they're doing it on their own infrastructure and they can get some of the benefits like that but they're not going to get the benefits of um you know as i say of opening up to the cloud of accessing other people's data of you know making more of their own available they're not you know working with fintechs where you know that's all outside their domain i mean there's a i think there's a lot of you know uh, a lot of questions about you know how how they can get the full benefit if they stick on private cloud but then also obviously that's really only a solution i think for the biggest you know there are many many financial institutions that need to live in this world you know in this more hybrid world what do you have a sense of what the savings are from the institution or the bank or the financial institutions that that migrates to the cloud and equally what the profitability from the cloud operators side is to this business? I mean, is it a win-win for both of them on a, on a very substantial scale? Well, a win-win, the cloud people will tell you that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, I mean, the first question is the avoided cost. So there is no question that um, reducing cost and complexity internally is a saving. So, and there's no, there's no question about that, I think. And, you know, getting away from fixed cost to variable cost hmm. is, obviously one of the huge kind of benefits of moving to cloud. Um, but but um, nonetheless, cloud sticker shock is a thing. And, uh, you know, I talk to more and more companies that discover, you know, particularly when they start to have multiple SaaS providers, you know, cloud applications that, you know, that they, they, they start to find that this, this gets expensive. Um, you know, it's all, a lot of it is, vo it's all volume based. Uh, or it's seat based and it can be, you know, it can get, it can start to rack up. So, um, you know, I think it's just, it's a different equation, um, but I think in the near term, you know, it's the savings that that will definitely drive it. And I think they're quite right to do that. In terms of the profitability of the cloud companies, I mean, obviously Amazon Web Services uh, makes profit for Amazon, which is a bit of a shock really for all of us because uh, <laughs> Amazon, 
thrived by never making any profit for many, many years. And when they took the wraps off AWS and showed us what that business was doing, you know, three or four years ago, lo and behold, it's got a really nice margin. They are uh, very dominant in the business and, and are making a very good profit out of it. Um, all these big companies, you know, still in investment mode. Um, and I think the real question, you know, and this is a really difficult question, is what happens five to 10 years out if we do end up with three or four dominant platforms in the West, leaving outside China, China and Russia here, if we end up with three or four big platforms, what, what will it cost? What position will they be in uh, to you know, set, set the fees? And so um, you know, a big part of the discussion now is around how you access multiple clouds. How do you, can you build a layer on top that allows you to tap into and access Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, and so on, and then play them off against each other. I mean, that's what everybody wants to do. Nobody wants to be tied to one supplier. And I think that's that's the big kind of issue now in cloud. But there are now enormous barriers to entry into the cloud industry. I mean, it's it's it is not a an industry which which a, a, a new a Walmart uh, could come in or not. I think it's pretty safe to say that all the big IT players that had a, had an eye on this, like IBM and Oracle, have missed the boat. Um, IBM, you know, has a public cloud service. They aren't investing. You look at their capex; it's tiny compared to the big boys, and uh, they aren't they aren't in the game anymore. Um, Oracle has a slightly different strategy and is you know is not is is, is providing infrastructure at the kind of base level um and has a business but you know i don't think they're going to be uh go toe to toe with the amazons and googles or i shouldn't keep mentioning google because google is still way behind amazon and microsoft are way out in front and i think you know the question is who's going to be able to, to match them you, you mentioned china um china is a player in this in this market or not um it's a play it's a player in the chinese market uh <clears throat> so the cloud um, so the consumer cloud, like a lot of technology markets um, in China, you know, the consumer market has arrived first. Um, it has very developed, you know, well-evolved consumer internet cloud services market. So when you use email in the cloud, you know, your use your Gmail, that is cloud. That's a service running in the cloud. So um, obviously Tencent and Alibaba, you know, are very sophisticated uh, companies with massive uh, massive customer bases. Well, they have gone, they've followed Amazon and Google and Microsoft into public cloud and enterprise computing. And, um, you know, certainly have, Alibaba has a pretty sophisticated operation now, but will any Western companies want to put their data into a Chinese cloud? If the price is right, I would have thought perhaps yes. But, uh... Well, it's a question of who you trust here. And, uh, um, you know, I think, I mean, any any data, certainly any data held inside China, I mean, this, this question about geographic ring, ring fencing of data comes up, but any mm -hmm. data held inside China now, whether for a Chinese or a foreign cloud company, mm -hmm. is actually sitting on a server that is majority owned by a local Chinese company, mm -hmm. because you can't go it alone as a foreign company there. So all mm -hmm. that data is sitting there with an easy reach of the Chinese Communist Party, and let's be clear. What about Europe? Final question. Um, does Europe have, um, I mean, a Macron, a Macron cloud? Uh, well, um, I mean, <coughs> uh, I, so I, I'm afraid I don't know what Macron's plans are on this one, but I can tell you that the same names and the same American players are dominant in Europe in the same way that they are in most parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> Europe's strategy, and I think it's quite interesting, is, and I, th I think it's a sensible one, uh, seems to me to have shifted towards regulating and trying to set the rules, and not just for Europe, but for, for the world. Try to set data rules for the world, and then hold the feet of the American companies to the fire. And we've obviously seen it with you know, privacy shield and the kind of standards for data and what, you know, owning and, and, and holding 
the data of European citizens. We've seen it with GDPR, which, mm -hmm. you know, living in the States as I do, for me, it was amazing to see a piece of European regulation around privacy, which was scor quite frankly scorned yep. in America mm -hmm. at first, mm -hmm. to now be seen as the model uh, for the world is really quite startling. I live in California. California's um, state privacy law, very much modeled on GDPR, is you know the model for for U.S. states now. So I think that's a good strategy for Europe. You know, don't try and own the infrastructure, um, but set the rules. Um, mm. And I think they're doing quite a good job. Okay. Well, let me turn to Paul. Paul Taylor. I mean, you recognize the industry as described by Richard. His concerns are your concerns, or. Uh, where are you going to make a buck out of it all? Paul Taylor. S sound. Sorry, I, cer I certainly identify the concerns. I would come at it from a diff different angle though. So, I mean, the word cloud is, is, is nearly becoming a meaningless term because it's a bit like saying computer, computers are the internet. Uh, it'd be, so we need to drill down on, on what, the, what the developments have actually been and where they are and where the benefits are. So there's a the better term is what what we call cloud native or what people in the industry call cloud native, and that means a kind of all encompassing you know all in approach to developing IT systems or computer infrastructure in the cloud, and kind of somewhat ironically, the physical hosting and the presence of Amazon and Google is not a particularly important part of of that. So so what elements do we have? Um, the, the first one is kind of, you know, extreme automation in how we handle and manage our, our systems. So when something goes down or when a problem occurs, uh, you know, when you look at this from a statistical basis or what's likely to go wrong or what's likely to occur, you can predict it. So instead of having a bunch of people you know, in the data center running around fixing things, you just fix things automatically. Um, a second area is in test. So instead of having, again, uh, manual testing and in banks still today, or traditionally, there's a huge amounts of testing involved in any rollout. Um, the, the manual testing is expensive and slow, but it's also not very comprehensive. And uh, of course, and a lot of kind of um, IT problems associated with, with these things are actually what happens when, a, when, a, when an upgrade happens. Um, and you know, I, I won't go through the full, full thing, but another one is continuous deployment. Um, in the traditional industry, you know, we have big bang releases or major upgrades it happens once a year or maybe twice a year. And, then the, and, and the more that you upgrade at each time, the riskier that up upgrade becomes. And so in the cloud native world, we've moved to continuous deployment, which basically just means, I mean, perhaps um, it, it's once a week or, or once a day. And you would put uh, new software live, for example, on one percent of your servers, uh, see if it w w worked, and if there's there is a problem, you can immediately roll back and fix it. But but you've you've clearly isolated the level of the problem to being something that, that is associated with that change, and the, and it goes on and on and on. Um, automatic orchestration, um, and and I think I'll come on to which is kind of data privacy uh, and encryption. And when you add all these things together, you get a fairly compelling suite of um, technological features, which add a lot. And then, of course, you can put it in, uh, somebody else can run the computers for you and, 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 and save you the effort. When it comes to, you know, the issues of data privacy and encryption and things like that, I mean, we have to, you know, if we can just do a, um, a fairly, um, you know, data-based investigative post-mortem on what issues have happened. Uh, data breaches do happen, um, systems are hacked, and nearly always they're legacy systems because they've got terrible IT infrastructure, they've got terrible security protocols, and, the, and they really have, you know, a, a, a customer data is just sitting there on the systems as, as plain text, there's no real protection. Once a hacker's in, the, the hacker's got access to everything. Nearly all, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of those problems happen in legacy systems. If you're worried about your data, do not just let it sit on something that you've been running for 20 years. Or 30 years that's a that's a very bad approach yeah, but but in practicality what does it mean there's you want your your data encrypted on the disk you want your data encrypted in transit and you should be doing that in any system doesn't matter if it's in your own data centers or, or in the cloud and if somebody gets access to the system um you know it, it, a, a good level of access is basically uh, you know what Richard says is if they if they can steal a physical device what level of access do they have and your attitude towards that should it should be that they don't have anything. So with, with really good uh, privacy key, key encryption and management, 
uh, you, can, you can do well by that. Nothing's completely bulletproof, but the thing that you have to realize with, with hackers, privacy, ransomware is they attack the easiest systems. They attack the systems that are easiest to get at. So if you're at the top, you know, the top few percent of the top of the pile or even the, in the top 50 percent in terms of privacy security uh you, you're, you're in a much better place um you know if if you if a burglar's trying to uh trying to burgle the home walks down the street they're going to walk into the house that's just left the doors the doors open the winds open if somebody else has the burglar alarm that's probably going to be the one that, that that's that's attacked uh that's attacked least so nothing's perfect but it, it is not the cloud itself that determines whether Data or privacy is is an issue or not? It is, it is using the best modern practices, and you typically find because cloud native systems are newer and more modern, they have adapt, adopted those practices, and that is the thing that makes them uh, makes them safer. So, so I think Richard made an important point, which is why why all this um, talk about the cloud. Now, in a sense, there isn't any discussion about the cloud because it's already happened. So, and, and it, you, you get a kind of phenomenon in, in kind of technological development whereby people talk about a thing for a very long time and there's kind of early users. And then before people really notice it, the change has already happened. And for example, in electric cars, so I, I think we're kind of there. A few years ago, we're saying by 2050, we'll have electric cars. Now they're saying that we'll all have electric cars in three years. And, 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 you know, when the change gets momentum, that becomes, uh, you know, the, the reasons become compelling, but also you're going to get stuck if you get left behind. I think the skills problem is actually one of the biggest problems because um, every part, every advantage that you get from the cloud is by starting from scratch and doing it properly in this new paradigm. And that um, the skills aren't terribly difficult to learn, but it is, it is a different skill set and, and, and a different mentality. And I think that you're, um, I mean, you've got a very interesting career choice if, if you work in legacy banking technology, because on the one hand, that's definitely the past, but on the other hand, no graduates want to learn that. So, so you're actually in a, in a diminishing um, pool of people who can uh, fix the legacy technology and, and, and do it well. But also, and wrapping all this up, the cloud, so it is true that Google and Amazon and Microsoft and to a certain extent, IBM and Oracle compete in the cloud space, but but there is no competitor to the cloud. And when you really look at the differences uh, between um, you know AWS and Google, it's a bit like listening to a music genre you've never heard before. When people say these two bands are completely different, and you go, well, it all sounds the same to me. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the similarities between these cloud providers, um, and and you can go to a presentation, and and, and they are passionate about the you know about. Uh, why this database system will beat this other database system. And it's all kind of true, but the, the, the mindset that you have to, you, you, you don't have to change your mindset or attitude to move, move from one to the other. Um, Richard talked about, you know, layers on top. And I think this is, it, this is a thing. And I think this will be one of the biggest trends. So it's a bit like the kind of battle between, um, you know, handset manufacturers and uh, telephone networks and app developers, and, and who, who is winning in that? So it used to be uh, the Nokias of the world and the Vodafones of the world controlled it, and then the Apples of the world controlled it, and then the app developers controlled it, and now it's back to, uh, and, 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 and this, this kind of dance goes on about who, who is winning in this. And there is a very large movement to have uh, cloud uh, uh, neutral systems, and Thought Machine, which develops core banking engines, uh, our software runs equally well on, uh, on Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. And we do this by having, uh, by having a completely new, neutral architecture. Now we have very good partnerships uh, with, with uh, the cloud computing companies and banks choose them for, for, for particular reasons, but, when, but it's not gonna suit our business model very well when a bank says, okay, we wanna use Google. And we say, well, we're, 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 we're on one of the other ones. So I think that's a big trend, but I also think another trend will be once the software, it, it will become more of a software pitch than a hardware pitch. And when it becomes more of a software movement, then banks will actually consider running uh, on-premise on premises systems, but it'll look to software providers as if it's exactly the same as Google Cloud and, and Amazon Cloud. So it'll be a, it'll be, be a, a somewhat blurring, blurring of the lines, but I, I, I predict the trend in the future will be people will be less worried about who physically owns the servers and where they are, 
and more about the nature of the technology, the benefits, the cost benefits, the security, and, and everything else. And if and if physical hosting is an issue, it won't be that difficult to solve. Right. That's the point that uh, I, I take away from what you're saying, that the physical location, the physical dumping of data into the cloud is almost uninteresting. What's much more interesting to you is re-engineering the institution that is going to use the cloud. And you want to re-engineer that institution to make it compatible with all the uh, potential of the cloud. Uh, and I, I, that's I, I, the point at which you, you make your money. Yes. I, and, and I think so, so four machine sells core banking engines to banks, uh, but the benefits that we sell to the bank are not about reducing their data center costs, even though that is true. There's two huge advantages. The one is an operational run cost of the bank by allowing them to run, uh, to modernize every aspect of the bank and make it purely digital and purely automated online journeys. That saves a huge amount of uh, effort and cost in the bank. And the second one is, uh, the, the kind of unit cost in deploying an upgrade or a change, or the cost of change in the bank, um, just by saying we can do extreme levels of really bulletproof testing before features are rolled out and do it all automatically and all quickly, and that saves the bank a headache. And what's more, then they can say to the regulator, look at this huge test report we've done. It's really, really good. And, and you know, everyone should be a winner um, um, out of this freeing up a uh, budget in the bank so that they can actually do what thought machines goal is to do, which is to um, have them give more modern stacks, but better customer features and, and, and so on. So there's, a, there's too, much, too much cost and weight in legacy technology spent on things that you call are not visible value add features to the end users, fix all that using a technology and then that, that frees up that space. Yeah, I mean, I, I seem to remember talking to somebody who was uh, involved with uh, NatWest's technology and you know the legacy systems have survived there for 25 years. Uh, Alina, what's your take on all of this? You, this is meat and drink to you. Tell me, tell me whether you recognize the picture that Richard is giving or, or you focus more on the uh, potential that, um, that uh, Paul is, is, is offering his clients. I guess from my perspective, the key point really, as Richard mentioned, cloud brings the new operating model and the new ways of working, and this ultimately brings a transformation, uh, just as Paul mentioned, to the digitalization. But it's not just the technology which matters, it's from the business side, how you look at it. And I think what I see with my clients, which are financial services in most of the cases, sometimes they go to cloud because it's trendy and because it's topical and they may have done it, you know, maybe three or four years ago, but they don't necessarily track those benefits, which they set out in the start. So things like the cost, for example, or the speed or the agility. So in the end, when they do transfer data onto the cloud, they perhaps don't always use, you know, the cloud native features that well to actually drive all of these benefits. And then what technically tends to happen is the costs don't necessarily always reduce and you don't reach this ultimate benefit which you want to reach. I just want to say that the key thing from me is understanding what is your compelling business driver from the very start. And it can be things like pure cost play, or it could be increasing your market share and, you know, digitalizing, changing your process, your project, or it may be something very simple like data center closure, and you have a deadline for it, and you kind of want to do lift and shift just to stay compliant. I think um, what I find, some of the things which tend to slow down this journey are things like risk and assurance, and Richard talked about some regulatory angles, but I don't like to say in Europe, specifically in UK, there are quite a lot of regulations like EBA, ESMA, FCA, PRA, and they are bringing this additional scrutiny, which perhaps is slowing down the banks quite a lot. I think the second thing, it's ways of working. And this is to my earlier point, bringing together the business and technical teams and also the risk teams to work together jointly so that it's not just a technology change, but it's actually bringing the benefits to the business. 
I think the third thing is maybe about finance. So to my earlier point, we don't always see our customers getting these benefits or realizing them. Sometimes uh, it has to do with their internal kind of the way how they operate. So perhaps they can't actually in detail ascertain which business is spending what and how they could really, really reduce it. So the key things here is working together again between the business and the IT and thinking through more strategically around the costs, the forecasting, how you do the data-driven solution around that. And I guess my last point really um, is uh, just talking about the skills, and this is back to Paul's point, I really agree with that one because skills are really difficult to find and, it's, and everybody is looking for them. I think it's hard to hire, it's hard to retain them. And it's also, you know, some things like cloud compliance or maybe cybersecurity, those are really in demand, everybody is looking for them. But I guess in future it will be uh, data analytics in the cloud and things like this. And this is, um, well, quite hard. And I've seen organizations struggling with this and bringing somebody like consultancies to help as they uh, bring more people internally. Okay, let me put, press you on, on this business of cloud native. I mean, as, as I understand Paul's point, um, you've got to be effectively cloud native in order to take advantage of the potentiality of the cloud. If you are not, if you are sort of, as it were, dominated by legacy systems, you're just going to use the cloud as a kind of warehouse. You're going to stick all your crap in, in, in them. Yes. They're going to look after it maybe a little bit better than you would do, but you're not taking advantage of the potentiality of the cloud. Is that your view? And first, is that how you see your clients operating? Are they really changing their business processes root and branch to take advantage of what the cloud offers? Or are they just viewing it as a, you know, a, a way station, something that they can, they can do over a weekend kind of thing? I would probably say it depends on the client and it depends on even within the client and a particular business. I have seen that there are some challenges with uh, making sure that you realize all, all these potentials because sometimes the transformation starts not as a transformation but as a lift and shift. And then by the time it's lift and shift, people don't necessarily go back and start the transformation. But this goes back to my earlier point about the compelling business cases and really asking what is it the client wanted to achieve. I've seen, for example, a global bank that really want to transform their credit decisioning, and they currently have a global system which is on legacy, which is 40, 45 years old in all the different places. And they want to move to cloud in principle. They want to transform not just the cloud angle, but the whole end-to-end -end credit decisioning. But you know, they are challenged by how will we ensure that the regulator angle is going to really work? How do we ensure that we don't lose access to data? And they've been you know, thinking this through for the last two or three years uh, that I've known them, right? And these are some of the challenges I've seen. Well, I, that's you bring up regulation again, because that was the second point I wanted to ask you about. You, you, uh, you, you suggested that in the UK, the regulators may actually, Oh, I guess uh, maybe slowing down adoption of the cloud because they, the regulators are a little bit concerned about this. I don't mm. know this newfangled idea. It's it's not what a regulator is used to. Is that is that a serious problem in the UK that the regulators are lagging a little bit behind the technology? I would probably look at it slightly differently. I think in many cases, it becomes a challenge when the organization started moving to cloud purely as a technology angle, but they haven't thought about these wider regulatory risks. So if I bring this to light, uh, the regulator asks for a defined exit strategy and then a more defined and tested exit plan. So if you first engineer everything on Google, for example, and then you figure out that you can't actually move it to AWS because your tools are non-competitive, not like you, you can't do that. Or for example, you can't move it to on-premise because you know you 
don't have data centers or you don't have the budget for it, then it becomes a problem. And what we have been doing with the clients is thinking about this regulatory angle from the start or in the early phases, thinking through what are the key risks, the challenges, the controls they embed from the very start, rather than trying to fit this retrospectively, because it's going to be time consuming, again, it's going to be costly, and perhaps there may be some regulatory, you know, scrutiny later on. Okay, Richard, I mean, cloud native regulation, I don't know what you might take away from what Paul and uh, Alina have been saying, but your, your response? Um, I, th I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy to criticize or to suggest that you know the banks that the, the regulators are moving slowly that they don't understand it and so on i mean their job after all is is uh, to be cautious here clearly you know one of the very big questions is how they deal with the massive concentration mm. that you know we're seeing in the cloud um and they want to know that you know banks understand all the risks that they're taking that they can control their own suppliers they understand the risks in their suppliers because the, the banking regulators can't reach out and control Amazon Web Services. Maybe one day they will. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly if Amazon itself gets into the finance business. But uh, for now, um, you know, there's, there's absolutely no upside for them in, in allowing things to move too fast. So I think this is, this is going to move slowly. Um, and I think it should move slowly. Do you, do you feel that the regulators are generally well disposed towards uh, banks utilizing the crowd effectively, subcontracting a whole bunch of business that was pretty core to their activities until the cloud emerged? Are the regulators at least uh, aware of the, I mean, do, do they see this as a plus? I think, I think they're very, very uh, aware of the business model risk to banks, the threat to banks and ultimately therefore the threat to their own regulatory span of control. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what we're seeing right now is um, companies with uh, better systems, with cloud native systems, with um, very, you know, with the reach of the internet, um, often with big consumer brands, some of these consumer internet companies that are getting into finance and they're cherry picking the best parts of, you know, the bank's business. and. The business model of these big consumer banks is still what it always was that the checking account is at the center they make money on a lot of things around it um but those things around it are being picked off so mm. from a regulator's point of view it's absolutely essential that regulated entities have the opportunity and the scope to compete to you know to compete for the most profitable business and not become sitting ducks to put it, if i can put it that way so i think there is a real awareness in 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 the regulatory circles you know that that banks have to adapt and they want banks to adapt um and uh, it's just a question of you know the speed at which they can do it and what about <laughs> this idea of um I, I'm never quite sure what cloud native really means, but it's a sort of bottom up building of capability to utilize the cloud and presumably institutions that either don't have a leg, well, institutions that are startups or that are willing to throw out their legacy systems and pretend they're startups have a real advantage there. I mean, is that, uh, is cloud native a, a, a concept you're, you, you view positively? I mean. It, it does require an awful lot of stripping out. For an existing institution, it requires stripping out um, business practices that have been there and, and you know, hardware think, that's been there for a long time. <coughs> I think Paul explained it. I, <coughs> excuse me. I think Paul's explained it very well indeed. And, you know, it is a diff, it's a different approach from, you know, it starts from the ground up in how you um, develop, how you analyze a problem, how you develop a product, how you iterate on a product. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of more flexible, agile development approach on a different platform is completely different. And it's, and, you know, you can't, um, you can't kind of mix it with, you know, the, the legacy develop, development models that, you know, these institutions start with. So at least in my mind, and I'm not deeply technical, so, you know, Paul will be a bit better person to, to kind of discuss that, but I, but I, you know, I do think that's a, a fundamental challenge. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. So um, it's 
it, it's actually there's a pretty easy answer to this. It, so cloud native doesn't have a, a legal definition. It's, it's not a protected thing, but but it, but it does have a definition definition in industry. And anybody watching it, just type in uh, what does cloud native mean into Google or uh, and the cloud native computing uh, foundation has has a checklist of things and you can check check against it so you know and so, it, so as i said it's not a watertight legal definition but it's pretty solid except the term in the industry you know um you know, kubernetes you know uh, horizontal scaling automatic orchestration and i won't won't we'll go through it but but the cumulative uh, uh, um, of all those technologies put together means cloud native and hosting is part of it but perhaps 10 percent of it but the reason those things are there is because something that it, it, you know we need to realize the banks is that no one really has unique problems the, the, the issues of data privacy issues of high availability issues of um the data residency issues of staying within the law are, are, are universal they just have different weightings in different industries and different levels of importance and, and different rules but the themes are all the same uh, there's no regular <coughs> that says yeah you can do whatever you want with the data it's it, it's absolutely fine and and when you look at systems so why why were these cloud native systems developed and a lot of it was developed if you look at something like gmail it is developed to make sure that email is super secure and you know, so you might think that financial transactions are one of the most sensitive things, but but perhaps not compared to email. And when you consider the number of companies that, that use Gmail as their email system, including many, many banks, and all that is encrypted and all that is happening, you know, in thousands of places around the world and being uh, stored in data centers in different countries, and it's pretty damn secure. That is where the trust comes that, uh, that similar things such as banking transactions uh, can actually be done in a secure way. And when you also think about how annoying it would be if your Gmail, uh, if your email disappeared, which used to happen, of course, all the time when we had a company server and, uh, we, and we, we just had to hope it was there. And, and you see that you know, there's a lot of universality uh, uh, to these problems. And can I just make one point about, about the regulator? It, it, so I've never met a regulator who wanted the wrong thing. They just, uh, it, 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 they all want, you know, safe, safe systems and want systems where the consumer is protected. They want systemically important systems uh, to be free of kind of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, shocks and risk and things like that. So I think the regulators are going at, uh, I have no complaints about the speed the regulators are going at. It, it, it isn't stopping anything that our bank clients want to do to go live. Um, and I think that there is a there is a good awareness uh, in in the market and a good awareness of what to do. And most bank most regulators are saying that it is fine to put um, uh, things in the cloud as long as you've taken the necessary uh, necessary precautions. But I'd also say, you know, while there may not be an upside, you know, the idea that there's an upside advantage is an extreme downside advantage to not doing anything because. Uh, unfortunately, you know, from my in industry insider perspective, the number of banks that have catastrophic failures on legacy technology is very big and not always announced, but, but regulators give those banks a very hard time. Once, fine. Twice, you're in trouble. Three times, you got to do something. And, and you know, so, so different banks and are different states of the journey and different states of, of their own internal but there are enough banks that really are in trouble and, and have to get off. And as I said, there isn't really an alternative. It's like you can stay where you are or you can do, but anything new you're going to do in nearly any industry will be a cloud native solution. There's no kind of competitor to the cloud. So it, so, um, it, it, it is a journey that's going to happen. We just need to make it happen in, in the most agreeable way. There's no competitor to the cloud. To the cloud. I think that's a really interesting uh, way just a final point, but one thing, startups, financial startups in the, well, tech, fintech startups in the banking, asset management, payments area. I mean, is it easy for startups to, to access the cloud to start from using the cloud rather than, as it were, trans, trans, transfer yeah. their existing business model to the cloud, actually to start as cloud-based? Uh, Paul, is that is that the route that uh, fintech startups ought to take? It, well, I'll, I'll be honest. It isn't. It isn't even a question that anybody considers. I mean, if you if you hire a new graduate, they wouldn't understand the question as opposed to what. So so, uh, but, but the barrier to, <clears throat> the barrier to entry to launching something in cloud is so cheap. I mean, you could if you're a startup, you could just put it put all the fees in your credit card and off you go. You don't have to talk to AWS. You just sign up on the website and go. 
Um, so, um, I mean, I, the minimum possible alternative would be to order a bunch of servers and install it in your office and do a bunch of things like that. So, uh, so there's basically no barrier to entry to start up working in the cloud. It's very easy. After a while, those credit card bills will get big. So it advise you <laughs> to do something else, but, but it's very easy to get going. Okay, final point from Alina and Richard. What could go wrong, Alina? I mean, to be honest, there are all the different risks which the organization may want to consider. But I think the key for me, uh, let me put maybe a couple of them. So number one, it's potentially missing out on the opportunities to maximize your strategic benefits around cloud. And I think uh, coming to Paul's point, if you are like a smaller business, probably you'll maximize them straight away. If you are a large organization, it may potentially take you a bit longer and uh, there will be good benefits of new operating model, new ways of working, but you may not see them, you know, necessarily in year one. The second thing, I guess, it's resilience. And from resilience, there is quite a lot of angle in terms of ensuring that you have the quality and continuity of your service. So this is somewhere where the regulator tends to probe in. And this is something also linked to the exit strategy or concentration risk example, which Richard brought out. Um, and I think that the last one, which I think is quite a big one, so that's a risk of the data loss, data corruption, and more specifically, PI data. We've seen banks where they put data into cloud, they don't have appropriate controls for PI data, and they don't necessarily monitor it uh, well enough to see what is going wrong when it's going wrong and they don't necessarily report it i wouldn't say that this happens in every possible organization but i've seen this happen and there is a big risk around it richard the final word is with you is there um... well, I'll, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave you with a strategic risk just uh, thinking further out <clears throat> so google and amazon and apple all of these companies are heading towards financial services themselves um, so how do banks feel, how do any financial companies feel about becoming dependent, as I suspect they will in many ways for their technology, on competitors? And we're already seeing that in retail, where a lot of retailers feel very uncomfortable being dependent on Amazon Web Services. Um, I think long term, you know, how are the banks going to feel being dependent on their, by far, I think, some of their biggest competitors? Um, you know, this is some way out. Um, I think it'll happen. And for my money, I think sooner or later, the cloud companies will split up. I honestly think that Amazon Web Services at some point will be a standalone company as will Google Cloud. Um, it won't happen this year or within five years. But, you know, if we look a decade down the line, I think the, the technology business, you know, as, as Paul said, this has been going on a long time. A lot of these ideas that we talked about, they will have matured this new platform will be dominant and a lot of new competitors will have turned up on the scene. It's very interesting that AWS was separated from Amazon when it came to the European uh, the uh, agreement on uh, on a uh, digital digital services tax in Europe. Um, that, that would apply to Amazon, but not necessarily to Amazon Web Services. Uh, can I, unless you have a point to, to correct me on that, Richard, um, can I thank Richard, can I thank Alina, and can I thank Paul, and of course, all of you for watching. Uh, it's a fascinating area, um, slightly above my pay grade, I fear, but uh, I do my best to try and understand what's going on. Many, many thanks to all of you. Good to talk. Thank you. Thank you.